Now, where did I put it? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the Toolbox. Tools for life and everything in between. Stuff you can use or toss, it's up to you. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us again for the fourth episode of Tools for the Toolbox. Uh, I'm with a buddy of mine. We both served in the Canadian Forces together and I wanted to let him introduce himself as usual. So uh, who are you and what is your military background? Sure, my name is uh, Simon McGinnis. I enrolled in uh, Canadian Forces in 1993 with the 2nd Battalion Royal uh, New Brunswick Regiment. And uh, I was there for about six weeks, and then I got injured on my basic training. So I uh, took a, a medical leave and uh, spent some time with the base Perrys. I was posted to CFB Chatham in uh, Miramichi, New Brunswick. And uh, so I worked for about a year and a half to two years with the base Perrys, getting back into uh, top physical shape because I always knew that uh, the military was what, what I wanted to do at the time. So I ended up completing my physio and rehab and uh, made my journey back to health. And uh, a year and a half later, I was reposted to the detachment base in Moncton, New Brunswick with the 4th Air Defense Artillery, and that was in 1997. And at that point, I completed uh, the basic training and went on from there. In 2000, I did an exchange with the 8th Desires and the Army Cadet Program, and I was there for approximately uh, a year and a half. And at that point in time, I took a leave of absence for... Uh, some education. And then in 2002, I came back to Canada uh, on a request to join a cadet detachment as a CIC instructor. And uh, I also got to do a little bit of work with the 89th Field Battery in Woodstock, New Brunswick. And then in 2005, I got reposted to the cadet detachment here in St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, where I have been uh, for 15 years now. And in 2006, I retired after 10 years of service. So you were artillery, air defense, and then the Hussars are, aren't they armored? Yes, they are. Yeah, I did an exchange with the with the eighth desires. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, we never got to do anything like that in the engineers. They just said we all. That's all we ever hung out with other engineers. The infantry right, every yeah. once in a while, but we never really like yeah. got traded around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you do now? Uh, I for the last ten years, I like, like I said, I I uh, posted out uh, in two thousand six. And then uh, two years later, I uh, returned because I'm originally from Calgary, Alberta, but I've grown up all my life in uh, New Brunswick. I um, have been here in Newfoundland now uh, since 2005. In 2008, I took a job with Canadian Pacific Railway in Calgary and uh, got involved in health and safety. So for the last 10 or 11 years, I've been working all across the country uh, in health and safety. It's a tough thing dealing with health and safety. I always had an issue with it. Um, it was more annoyance than anything, right? Like it, nobody likes having a guy around, but at the same time, it's you need you need the people to actually watch over this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so that uh, you've been out since 06. How was your transition? Uh, at like you, first, you were reservist was, mostly, right? So, was uh, it? no, I, I I did some reg force time with Fourth Air Defense because uh, right some some of my time with uh, Fourth Air Defense, uh, like I said, I was posted to the detachment base in Moncton. However, mm -hmm. I did do some uh, time in Gage Town. Okay, so that's where the 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 correlation to uh, reg force went. Uh, right. Although in my 10, 10 years of Armed Forces uh, career, I did not do any uh, deployments overseas. A yeah. uh, couple, couple of the units that I served with 
uh, we were tasked to go, but in the end, it just, uh, I guess, kind of worked in our favor that we didn't go. So, yeah, back to your question of how was my transition. Uh, at first, it was okay. Uh, I don't think I've really had any problems post transition until the last, I'd say, the last three years of my life. Uh, I've been having problems with leaving that in the past and moving on to my civilian life. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you're in the when you're in the forces, you become such a a big family. It becomes a real big part of your life and it's hard to give up. So I find myself going back to my army buddies and uh, people don't realize that they're like, well, what was your buddy? Uh, what was he trashing you? And well, that that's the way we are in the army. We, we, we trash everybody and, and uh, they come back with something even better. Absolutely. One of the things I love about uh, the the military lifestyle, and I've said this many times, is that we're actually a very small microcosm of Canadian society. Yes. And we get out of the army thinking that this is the way life should be. Why isn't everybody else like this? But like maybe you had 600,000 of us that are yeah. actually like veterans and serving and compared to 34 million, uh, it's not quite the same. <laughs> No, no. And, and, and then um, I, I, I didn't get married until post uh, release. Uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, she came into my military picture pretty much my last full year in. So we, we got introduced to each other in 2004. And then, like I said, I posted out in 2006. So for the majority of my time, we I, I've been I've been post service. So for me to go back and kind of fall onto my my army buddies and all that, it it, it kind of causes friction. But the way I look at it is, it's three degrees of separation because I, I'm finding now that I'm connecting with so many of my veteran friends, I'm I'm finding guys such as yourself that we serve together in different units, but pretty much at the same time. And we're all feeling the, the lack of closeness. And so we're still reaching out to everybody. So it's one of those things that, uh, we, we gain. I find that the farther people are away from each other, the more you want to see them. Oh yeah. Like yeah. The dudes here in town and we hang out and we chill, we go for beers, we do whatever, but it's the guys that, I haven't seen that are, you know, on the East coast in Gagetown or out on the West coast on the Island and stuff. And I'm just like, man, oh, exactly, I'd love yeah. to go for a beer with those guys. I know. Yeah. Like I, I, I spent three weeks in, in Petawawa and I, I ran into a whole bunch of guys up there and a lot of them are out your way in, in Edmonton and in Calgary and stuff like that. And I'm always constantly on the phone or on the text or Facebook chatting it up with those guys and my my east coast friends are like do you not know anybody in canada i'm like no because when you're in the canadian forces you, you you go to a bar and you're like oh yeah i served with two cli oh do you know john yeah he, exactly he, and you're like no you way. Know me and you're like right yeah okay <laughs> Yeah, I, I know of him, but I, yeah. or or I served served with him and different unit. But yeah, I know of him. Yeah, I love that when you you start talking to people who you didn't know while you were serving, and you start going, "Oh, did you know so and so from this unit?" And he's like, "Well, I know this guy who served in that same unit. They probably know each other." And you're like, "Oh, yeah, okay." Like, there's no you can have those multiple degrees of separation, and you'll start to find that we all know the same people. Oh yeah, for but sure. But we don't always know each other. <laughs> yeah. Cuz like uh last last summer I I flew to New Brunswick cuz that's where my parents are living and uh that's like like I said that's where I grew up. And I ran into a buddy um Jeff Alpa and Jeff and I served together in Gagetown and and we just kind of happened to 
cross either each other's path through business. And now we're constantly talking to each other and I'm a customer of his. And so, yeah, like this three degrees of separation for me lately has been slowly dwindling down to the one degree. I have my close circle now. I think after so many years being out, cause it's been, uh, six, six odd years now. And yeah. Yeah. You start to your extended family, the, the guys you all serve with and all them, they, uh, they start to start to whittle itself down, right? Like the guys that you hang out with the most, the guys you talk to the most, and you still yeah. have those friendships with the people outside that, but there are usually that, you know, three or four guys that you always talk to. Right. And yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, but anyway, um, so your health and safety now, what, yes. um, are you planning on continuing to do that for the future? How has that been affected by this whole COVID thing? COVID-19 hasn't really affected my job too much. Uh, on the, on the front end, it, it caused a little bit of more paperwork because I had to sit down and, uh, I guess put put together some safety uh, protocols for the workers and stuff. But I work in a uh, transportation industry in the oil and gas. So we've been deemed essential workers. And therefore, I've been still working from my office. Uh, the only way it's affected me is that because of the complexities of COVID-19 and the virus, uh, my family and I, we've decided for my wife and my three daughters to uh, self-isolate with her parents. So normally I would have two, I'd have three uh, daughters under five years old here in the house and my wife. But for the last eight weeks, it has just been myself and our dog. Well, that sucks to say the least. <laughs> it, it does. Yeah. It, the first, the first week was like, holy crap. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, Freedom. I can do whatever I want. I can do what I can do whatever yeah. I want. I can stay up. I can sleep in. I don't have to make my bed. Wow, this is awesome. And then week three was like, oh my gosh, like when's my family coming home? When's this virus going to get done? Yeah. But it, but it's it, it's been tough, but it's been okay because I still get to see my kids. I still get to see my wife. I, not the fact that I can hug them. But I still get to see them through a window or through FaceTime or however we yeah. do it. You gotta take what you can, right? Exactly. Yeah, you gotta you gotta make the best of a bad situation, and and a lot of that comes from our experience in the military. We we've had a lot of shitty jobs that we had to do in the military, and you just suck it up and uh, deal with it. Yeah, and sometimes you might have questions from other people saying, why are you still doing that? Like, it's stupid. But when it comes down to it, it's not the fact that the virus isn't really affecting people because here in Newfoundland, thank goodness, knock on wood, we've had very low numbers across the board. Yeah. But the way I look at it is it's better to be safe than sorry and have my family come back too early and then something happens and then everybody's got to pack up and go again it's, it's better to have them stay away until we know the ins and outs of everything that's happening with this virus and uh we're thinking it's only another couple of weeks and then we'll be back together i mean we'll we'll see how this thing turns out buddy i was going to say that the the military really preps us for these kinds of things anyway i mean nbc yeah. is one of them when you start doing your I've been I've been going around town. I see people with masks on, and they're always like, "Oh man, it's so hard to breathe." And I'm like, "You know what? Go in a gas hut." <laughs> exactly. Go do some push. Go do some push ups and jumping jacks with that yeah. mask on, with with, with a snowmobile yeah, suit exactly. on. Exactly. In, in the hottest in the hottest day of July in Gagetown. I, yes. Then exactly. Come I described it uh, to somebody the other day, and I was like, "You know, it's it's awesome when you walk into a room full of." Uh, of CS gas, tear gas, and you have to like wait for a second to it really affects you, then put your stuff on, then do a decon, then start doing jumping jacks and push ups and running around in circles and blah blah blah, then take it off in the room 
while doing a decontamination drill, and then put it back on. Like it was just, and they were they were just uh, yeah they were stunned, and they're like, oh, I guess this mask ain't so bad at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and then at the same time, t- try to remember the serial number off your yes, rifle. Yes, exactly, and who the commandant of the school is, and like just <laughs> random stuff. Yeah, but it's yeah, God save the yeah, queen, but, and whatever else they they want to yeah, throw. Yeah, and this is yeah. what I you know I always loved about the stuff that we take from the military, especially uh, from combat arm stuff, and is that we we get used to the protocol. There's a protocol in place. Yes. It's there for a reason. Do what needs to be done. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, no one wants to do it. But it's there for a reason. And it'll help everybody along the way later. Yes. So better to just do it. Complain about it while you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. But just get it done, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So um anything like planned for the future? Are you starting your own little side hustle? Or are you just gonna keep doing health and safety? Um I my wife and I, we've been talking about this. Uh, she is a elementary school teacher and she t- currently teaches, um, within the city of St. John's and that's 20 minutes from our house. And currently she's on maternity leave because our youngest daughter was born eight weeks ago today on March oh, the 7th. Right. Belated. Yeah. Yes. And, um, I guess a lot of my plans hinge on what's in store for her. She's applied for a couple jobs in our community. And if she gets those, then it will kind of dictate kind of where, where I can see my future right. going. Uh, yeah. So it could be still in health and safety. I'm open to, I, I've talked to a couple of recruiters and basically said, Hey, if there's anything in health and safety, I'd be open to that. If there's other opportunities that match my skill set, then let let's let's venture down that avenue and uh, see what's out there. And uh, I, I've talked to a couple of recruiters and basically said, "Hey, let let's try to take some of my military skills and transfer it to like the civilian world." Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. It is, yeah. The uh, the military skill set is a very specific skill set, and they, they they translate yeah. like you can translate it into something else, but it's like taking it's like trying to translate Aztec into English. Like it's possible, it's possible, yes. but there's a lot of inflection. There's a lot of you know assumptions based on stuff that most people don't know, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and there's <laughs> yeah. there's a a disconnect between how we roll versus how uh, the everyday Canadian works. Yeah. And that that's not a yeah. bad thing. I mean, that we have it set up like that for a reason. You know, one of my biggest challenges dealing with people was watching other people's work, ec- work ethic. And it, I yes. went to school uh, for a few years, and man, I tell you, I wanted to rip my eyes out. Yeah. Uh, I was in a classroom at one point with 43 or 45 people total. Out of that 43, there were two guys one of which was me. And of all of the rest, the 43 people, only four of those ladies was over 20. Oh, wow. And I wanted to shoot myself regularly. Yeah. Like it just, it was, it was so, I was so out of touch. Really, it, it wasn't them. I mean, they were doing what they do. They were on their phone constantly. They weren't paying attention to the, the instructor. They were doing whatever they were. But I was sitting there like, what in the hell? Like. <laughs> You're you're paying <laughs> yeah. to be here, and you're not even trying. And yeah, it, just, it drove me up the wall. Uh, oh yeah. But I mean, that was me, right? That was my issue. I, I I am the outsider, even though I was looking at it like, what is wrong with you? In reality, I was the crazy one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the other thing that I, I think really drives me that people don't get uh, in the civilian side is like timings and uh like i I remember when i got posted to cfp chatham with the the battalion there uh my first drill instructor and and in fact he and i are still friends to today and i have high respect for him and i remember him telling me on 
I think the second week that I was posted, he says, here's a little tidbit of information for you that I want you to take with you for the rest of your life. And it applies to every course that I take, that I give to you guys. If the timing says 0700, you need to be here before 0645. Because even when you're 15 minutes early, you're still late. Quite that far. Uh, that always bothered me, especially when you have like multiple chains of command that just push the timing even further. Like everybody adds 10 minutes, right? The RSM and the, the CO goes, okay, everybody be here by nine o'clock tomorrow. And then the RSM's like, okay, everybody, I want you here at eight 50. And then oh, I know. the major steps forward. All right, everybody eight 40. And then the sergeant major is out there. Okay, everybody eight 30. And then by the time it gets down to your sergeant talking to the sappers, he's like, all right, everybody show up at zero 600. <laughs> just like, what the fuck, man? He said nine. Yes, exactly. And, and then if you do show up at, 8:45 in the oh. morning, you're screwed because you're you get friggin' rocked. Yeah, you know, you're a wall because the sergeant major said I wanted you here at six. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but your 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 superior said nine o'clock, so I went with that. Yeah, exactly. But this here's the the thing that was actually quite hilarious. We uh we had a new CEO come in right before I got posted to Meaford, and he came in and he was like, "Okay, everybody, timing is." Whatever, I don't remember what the timing yeah. was he gave. And he started walking out of the room, right? And as he was walking out of the room, the RSM stepped up and he said, okay, everybody, I want to hear everybody 10 minutes beforehand, blah, 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 blah. And he, it started the chain, right? And I watched the CEO turn around <laughs> as he was leaving, just like jump around, come back and go, no. <laughs> I said, whatever. Like I said, nine. Yeah. Everyone will be here at eight. Five zero. Is that understood? <laughs> nice. And we were all like, "Oh, fucking rights, man! It's awesome." <laughs> and uh, we still showed up at like, I think it was like eight thirty or something, just to be sure. Yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you don't want to take it. Don't don't want to take any uh, liberty for. Uh, yeah, exactly. Free time. Yeah, it, you're right. Like timings is such a big issue. I mean, even for me, especially with kids, like I I try to be understanding when my two-year-old and my six-year-old don't meet my timings. <laughs> but it, it, there's, it's like a, a nail on chalkboards in the back. I'm watching the time just drain down. And I'm like, what? Just forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so hard to take. Yeah. It, it is what it is, I guess. The, oh, yeah. uh, the army puts these things into us and that's how we live our life now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's talk motivation. Sure, yeah. Now, motivation is a is a very tricky subject. And the reason I say it's tricky is because it's all well and great to be motivated. And it's all well and great to have people motivate you. But what is it like what do we why do we need motivation? Cuz I mean, I, I personally, if I need shit done, I just get up and do it. Right, yeah. I think for me that that's that's been my problem lately, probably the last year and a half. I, I've kind of gone through a little bit of a depression and realized that in order for me to succeed, I need to have the motivation to go do some things. And I guess one of the things that I see, one of the correlations to my time in the service was that we always did we always had training every day whatever whatever it was it, it could be just the smallest thing how to clean your boots how to clean your rifle and there was always a motivating factor that cleanliness was the next best excellence and i see that training ourselves is is one of the key to efficiencies and it's not news to anyone, but the experts speak of the importance of training. They tend to overlook their reality that training sometimes is often at the bottom of the list of priorities. And when we establish a, a, a training program, one of the things is trying to get yourself a buy-in and um, I guess giving it your best effort is the other thing the other side of uh motivation and and success one of the things that uh that i look at when i'm talking when i talk stress and stress um 
like what the the physiological effects of stress are and i've given a few lectures on this stuff and one of the things i say is when you're really stressed out one of the best things you can do is have a plan yeah and really break it down now in terms of motivation for me like the job being done is what motivates me to get shit done right <laughs> i'm i like to call myself the um the most active lazy person i know <laughs> or yeah. the, be- the best lazy person I know because I look at something and I'm like, I don't want to do that. But if I get it done now, I can be lazy longer. <laughs> like there's, yeah. I, do- I don't need to freak out last minute and try and get it done. I can just do whatever after. So what what is it that, why do you think it's important that we motivate ourselves or motivate others? Like why why do you think that's an important thing instead of just like everybody everybody just being the best lazy people we can be and just getting shit done. I I think if you don't motivate yourself, you're not going to, if you don't find that motivation, then you're just going to be, like you said, that lazy person and you're never going to do it. And you need to have that reward on the other side of things to push you to it. it. It's like getting the donkey to walk down the path, throw the carrot out in front of it, put it on the stick and keep that in front of his eyes and he's getting hungry. So he's going to go after that uh, carrot until he can get it. But you keep far enough in advance, then he's constantly going to be going for that carrot. But what if you run out of carrots? Well, that's why you keep it far enough away from the donkey. What I mean is that like, so I'm just going to play devil's advocate with you because sure, yeah. I'm, I, I like, I like to think of uh, discipline more than I like to think of motivation. The thing that I noticed is that when you have a um, when you have a carrot and stick kind of issue, right? You either have the benefit or the detraction. Is that eventually you're going to run out of carrots, right? Like if you have a carrot and you are on that donkey and you're walking down the street, when you get to where you're going, you need to give him that carrot. Otherwise, the carrot won't work later. Right. And if you're on the other side of it, if you're whacking this whacking this donkey with a stick all day long, and then he's not going to do shit, and he's going to buck you off, and you're not going to have a donkey for much longer. Right. And I guess the question I'm asking is, where does the... Because I train horses, right? Like, if I want a horse to do something, I just show them how it's done. And then they eventually learn. So if I want them to walk, then I, you know, I teach them how to walk, and I teach them how to walk the way I want them to walk. And in my mind, that's that's what discipline gets you, right? You teach someone to do something over and over and over and over and over again, like we do drill, and then that's just how they walk. Right. So, where do you think? Um, what do you think the difference is? Like, where where do you think motivation ends and discipline takes over? Where do you think discipline ends and motivation takes over? I think discipline comes in after the fact that you learn how to do it because you're not going to become disciplined at something unless you know how to do it. And um, most of us will have an interest in the continued success as a whole, but even the most selfless will have one eye on how the training can benefit them personally. So the question comes down to it, which is, I guess, the deciding factor of motivation. What's in it for me? will always be at the back or the front of a person's mind. So if you want to mo if you want motivation, you need to make sure that you can address it. And one way to highlight the benefit of motivation is to align it with performance. Yeah, that makes sense. And and if you're more transparent about how each of your training activities will impact on your success, then it's going to lend credibility and give you yet another reason to log on to the learning, uh, basically capture what you're looking for in the long-term process. So basically coming down to what's in it for me. And if we revert back, revert this back to our training days in the forces, they show you, they, they break it down in squads. So when you went to basic training, you didn't know how to stand at attention. So the instructor was in front of you and saying, well, okay, I'm going to break it down in squads. Squad one is this. And then squad two was this. And he breaks it down and breaks it down and breaks it down. So you know 
well, this is the instructions of how this particular assignment is going. Then what he does is he turns it over to the group and says, okay, everybody, squad one. And then he walks around and says, no, you need to fix this. No, you need to fix that. Oh, you're good on that. And goes around. And then you get used to that squad one, squad one, squad one. And it's constant repetition. And then as you build on those squads or pieces to the puzzle, you start realizing what's in it for me. Oh, well, I'm going to be successful at this task. And in the end, it's going to make us all look good as a team. That was one of my favorite things. Uh, but I did yeah. definitely had a uh, little bit of flashback there when you were just yelling squad one. I was like, oh, God. Oh, God, it's coming back. Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> yes. You're right. I mean, when I was an instructor, the same thing. We, you know, explain, demonstrate, imitate, demonstrate, imitate, imitate. Yeah. And you're constantly, you break it down into smaller pieces so that you can get a sense of accomplishment and a sense of completion when you get through them all, right? Exactly, yeah. Because w what are you essentially doing with breaking these tasks into, like, your squad? Well, at the end of your basic training, whether it's reserve or reg force 11 weeks versus 14 weeks the the end product is that graduation day when you're out on the parade everybody's going to look seamless yeah or they're supposed to look seamless <laughs> supposed, supposed to look seamless yeah, yeah. You, would, you would you would hope and pray that after 11 weeks that you're not going to be out of step or whatever. I, I've watched a couple, some like some straight up uh, abominations, and it's it's painful. <laughs> it is, yes. Yeah, but you're right. It if the moment anybody looks out of step, it becomes like it affects everybody. Well, like you 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 go to the fact of what what the instructors always talk to you. They say, well, if you give a man a, a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Yeah. You take him out and teach them how to fish you're going to feed them for a lifetime yeah yeah it, you know there's uh, a lot to say about charity versus instruction yeah obviously but um so the here's the thing that I, I i struggle with when it comes to motivation because yeah you know it's great and all to be motivated and you know you can watch some youtube videos out there and be like yeah this is awesome i'm all pumped up ready to go but what about those days where the, just like it's shit the motivation is not there. You wake up and everything hurts and you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to do anything. And it's raining outside. Like the, the really shitty days. Where do you garner motivation from that? Well, you got you, you, you just got to look at the fact of not trying to don't become stale. Um, some people have the strange notion that learning is supposed to be hard work and, being boring is all part of the package. So don't bore yourself. If you're pumping out the same lifeless training or motivation without thought for yourself, don't be surprised if you don't engage with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one of the hardest things you can do is teach someone something they don't want to know. Yeah. The way I see it is spice it up a little, add videos, record a podcast like what we're doing here. Uh, build a learning game. It's not as hard as you might think. But giving yourself a variety of opportunities to interact with the content, you can keep your training and your motivation interesting and fresh. Yeah, that makes sense. I, Again, like I said, I'm, I'm a big proponent of discipline. I would always say that if you, are, if you are disciplined enough, you don't really need motivation. But at the same time, it's nice to be motivated. Yes. Right? Like it, it feels good to, to be motivated <laughs> when, you, when you want to do something. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's also... Um, there's a lot to be to be discussed when it comes down to it because when you don't want to be motivated, when you don't want to do something and your motivation is lacking and you can watch all the videos on YouTube you want and you're just not going to get up and do the job, where do you think that there, there's an inner motivation, right? To get something done. There's the, That's what discipline stems from, right? There's a, there's a, there's a spark yeah. somewhere on the inside that says, okay, like get, get off your ass, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where do you, where do you think that comes from? Do you think that's taught, or do you think that's a like a learned skill? I think it, it it's a little bit of both. 
um, because... Or I should say, sorry, is it a natural thing or a learned skill? That's what I meant. I think motivation is a learned capacity. Although, although humans do have an innate motivation in them because the way our bodies are made. Well, survival can be a pretty <laughs> good motivator. Yeah, sur- yeah, survival of the fittest. And, and uh, although a lot of people kind of take them out, take themselves out of the gene pool in, in, in spectacular ways because they they don't realize the motivation of what they're doing, and so hence they end up ending their life and in the end getting the coveted Darwin Award given to their name. I love that thing. <laughs> yes, like some some of the stories you're you're just wondering where was the motivation for this person? Like, what was it wrongly placed, or are they just that stupid? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of times where you look at somebody and be like, "Where did you even come up with an idea like that?" <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like what? How? Where? When? Why? There's. There's a lot of things I see out there in the world and I just like, I want to, I want to walk up and slap somebody, right? Like, it's just like, just smarten the <laughs> yeah. fuck up. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and I, I'm not sure because, you know, I always said, this is like before the army. I was always, when I wanted to do something, I would just get up and do it. So there was no, yeah. like, I didn't need to learn how to be motivated when I wanted to do something. But there are people I know that even when they want to do something, they don't have the motivation to do it. Like it's, they don't even have the will to get there. So it's always been a question of mine is like, is, do you think it's an innate thing where people are just, you know, different people have different levels of motivation or do you think that they learn it as like children or, um, adolescents or even into adulthood? Yeah. I, I think, I, I, I think it comes down to a learned behavior because, if you study psychology a lot, mm-hmm. a lot of the behavioral problems happen because you're a product of your environment. And if you don't have someone teaching you motivation or discipline, then more chances out of none, you're not going to do something. And then you're going to get in the stupid funk of, well, I didn't do anything yesterday, so why do something today? Yeah. And uh, my, my, my friends all joke at me because typically because of the way that my brain has been wired and uh, through the, the different experiences I've had in the forces, I've tended, I've tended to be more of a procrastinator than someone that gets up and gets off their ass and goes and does it and then can be lazy for the, the 15 days later. Yeah. I'd rather be, I, I, I'm the opposite. I'd rather be lazy for 15 days and then spend the night of the 15th <laughs> and uh, pump it all out that night and then come in with a stellar project on the 16th and say, booyah. Yeah. And they, they always, they always laugh because like people will ask me to do something and I'll, I'll uh, wait till the very last moment. And they're like, are you procrastinating? I'm like, could be could be you might just work well under yeah. pressure i and, and that's what it comes down to for me psychologically that is my that's my motivator yeah. is that i'm better better suited to work under stress than get it done now and make sure it's done at first yeah i'm the same way my my mo- my motivator in life is why do something today that can be put off tomorrow <laughs> because tomorrow I'll be older and wiser and therefore I'll have more knowledge and I'll get it done. That's an interesting way to look at it. Like for for instance, um, when I took my educational leave uh, from the forces, I I took the time off to go to Bible college, and I was sitting in church history class and. We had this thousand, I forget how many word essay that we had to do. And we had to uh, have it all researched and footnoted and everything. And I waited to the very last moment. And I walked down to the library with a cardboard box. 
and I walked in and I had uh, 35 books in this box. And I put it up on the desk in the library and looked at me. He says, you know, Simon, you're only allowed to take three books. <laughs> I slapped a 20, I, I slapped a $20 bill on, on his table. I said, look, if these books aren't back tomorrow, you can keep the 20. Nice. And I walked up the hill carrying my box of books and people were friends of mine with, with cars were driving by and I, they're like, Oh, you want to drive up the hill? I'm like, Nope. Mm -mm. I'm on my way to go write a paper. That's funny. My, my, my roommate went to bed at 10 30 that night. I was still sitting in front of my computer with the books all over my bed, all over the floor and everything. I had note cards everywhere. And he woke up the next morning at 8.30, I, and I was hauling the last page off the printer. And he said, please tell me you did not stay up all night. I said, okay, I won't. <laughs> I won't tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> I won't tell you that. <laughs> and then I walked, I, I walked into class, and uh, the, the professor said, okay, everybody hand your papers forward. I said, here you go. See you tomorrow. <laughs> and I turned around, walked out, went back, went back to my room, and and crawled in bed. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and then two weeks later, the the papers came back, and I ended up with a B plus on it. Solid. And I was like, see, solid. Nice. Yeah, I I yeah. I work really well under pressure, and when I start getting uh, more tasks, and people are like, oh yeah, or this needs to be done, and this needs to be done, this needs to be done, I I get really good at whatever it is I'm doing because I find I focus more and I know a lot of people that get under stress and they just start to fall apart because they're like, Oh my God, I have this to do and this to do this to do. No, 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 no. And they start thinking about all the different tasks that need to be completed. And I just go, okay, well this needs to be done right now. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> and then when it's done, I'm going <laughs> to move on to the next one. So I, I, I think really when it comes down to it, what we could boil this whole topic down to tonight is for motivation is we just need to find the epic meaning at the heart of our journey okay explain that a little bit well, once you find out what the the meaning of your journey is or where your destination is going where you're going on your journey then you'll be able to set yourself up to put these motivating factors in place and it'll become like highlights for your training days. And in the grander scheme of things, you'll soon begin to see the value of what and why you're doing things. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, if you don't know your why, then you're not going to, you're not going to put the effort into it. Right. Like if you really understand what you are truly capable of or what you're truly designed, I don't like to use the term destined, but like designed to, uh, to do, and I, you know, I found out that early on when I was younger, uh, I was, I was always a protector. I like to defend people. I like to, uh, I, I'd wanted to be in the army since I was like four, right? right. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I looked at it as a, uh, this is the ultimate achievement of being not sacrificial, but like, I will be the first one that somebody has to roll over if they want to hurt my family, and I'd right, rather yeah. be that guy than the last guy. You got to roll over. <laughs> Yeah. So that really, that motivates like everything I do when I see somebody that is down and out and I want to help them. I want to help them because personally, I want to protect them from the difficulties that they're going through. Right. Right. Yeah. But I didn't really understand any of that until I was, you know, mid twenties when I was actually, I think I was in Afghanistan when I really kind of like it kicked into my head. Right. But yeah, it's a, it takes a while to figure that out. And some people never find that out. Oh, exactly. And so it, it comes down to what is relevant to you and your life journey. Because here's why the cookie cutter approach doesn't work. If you're pushing the same training as everyone around you, then everyone's going to find themselves working through content that may not be of use to them and you see this speed bump it can kill the momentum in your learning journey and it might drive you away from doing certain things and so what we got to do is we we got to segment our life or our training or motivation according to who we are 
And we need to keep that content relevant to ourselves and our goal. And when we do this, it won't seem such a, uh, a burden or a barrier or an impediment to us. And in that, then we'll get motivated to, I guess, to success and uh, looking for that gold medal in our life. Right. Makes sense. But what, I mean, success is a hard thing to define, right? People, oh, yeah. Yeah. you can't really tell anything. Obviously, the cookie cutter is not going to work for that. In, in my mind, the motivation only gets you off the couch, right? Right. And what really gets you to actually get the work done is the discipline to just get work done because it is a, I mean, these things work hand in hand, right? Like obviously you need motivation because you have to want to do something to do it. Yeah. Not all the time because there was lots of shit that I didn't want to do that I did anyway, <laughs> especially in the <laughs> army. Exactly. Sandbags. But yeah, fuck. Oh, I can't even tell you how many sandbags I've filled. <laughs> the, um, yeah. But we had discipline instilled in us from the military that says when Sergeant so-and-so says fill those sandbags and you don't sit there and go, well, what are we going to use the sandbags for? Right? <laughs> you just, Roger that, Sergeant. <laughs> and you yeah. go into it, right? Uh, the, the trick is motivating yourself versus motivating others. They're not the same thing, right? They can't use the same tools no. that you would to motivate yourself as you motivate others. And I, I think that's what you were trying to say earlier was that that cookie cutter doesn't work. Where you, each person has their own little idiosyncrasy or a little backstory that makes them think a certain way, that makes them do things a certain way. And actually, you reminded me earlier, there's a story that I wanted to tell. You said a, a sergeant of yours had said something that really you know, changed the way you looked at things in basic. Yeah. And uh, I had something similar at an Air Force sergeant who was talking about ethics and, you know, an awesomely intriguing course and it was it was so boring (laughs) (laughs) you want to you want to have 60 dudes or 60 troops all in the room staring at a powerpoint lecture about ethics while we're in the field and we're all exhausted and we're hungry and tired like we're not trying to pay attention but one of the things that he said that really kind of caught me and it actually shaped the way i handled my career in the military was he said, it is your responsibility as a soldier to question everything you're told. Yeah. And it blew my mind yeah. that someone in the military would tell me that I was, <laughs> that it was my responsibility to do that. <laughs> and eventually, like, he explained it more. And, you know, it's like, well, it's not about questioning every order. You're not going to say why, why, why. You're not a two year old, right? And, he fleshed it out a lot more and said, it, it's just about personally, you need to ask why this is happening. Right. To better understand the, the objective, to better understand the whatever it is that needs to happen so that you can then motivate yourself to do it <laughs> or motivate yourself to not do it at the other side of it. Because when you're talking ethics, you're talking, you know, is this right or wrong? Yeah. Versus should I or shouldn't I? I, I tried explaining this to some of the other guys that I've served with and other people that I've been in with, and they never quite grasped the concept like I did. I find it interesting because that motivated me to 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 live my life, to do my career the way that I saw it. And I questioned, I, I, I flat out questioned the sergeant major in front of my entire troop <laughs> as to why he was going to do something. Yeah. It was not the smartest idea. <laughs> I should have had more tact. I could have done it better. But it showed me something in myself and in him that I needed to see. Yeah. Right? His his answer to me was, I'm the sergeant major and I'll do whatever the fuck I want. And I was like, Roger that. <laughs> He's like, all right. Just the the knowledge of, of how that guy reacted to that question and how that guy um how I reacted to his answer. Right. It was a motivation in and of itself. Yeah. Right? Like I I then saw that I didn't really try to think of a, a nice way to put this. doesn't matter. Anyway, the, <laughs> the, the key point on this is that if you, if you know the why, I think I said this earlier too, if you know the why, you'll be able to get the job done, right? Right. Uh, but if I know the why, how do I, 
how do I get others to know the why? Right? Like I can explain, this is my why. This is why I do things. But how is that going to help you? As I said earlier, I'm the dude, type of dude that will get shit done right now so that I can be lazy later. And you're the guy that'll be lazy now so you can get shit done later. Yeah. How do I motivate you to do what I want? I don't know. Because, like, (laughs) it's individualistic, I think. And uh, I I guess sometimes if you don't know the why, you need to look out to the experts. And I I guess that's where the YouTube videos come. Talking to your friends. Uh, For me, one of the new skills that I'm starting to learn is woodworking not carving but like building uh, and stuff oh yeah um growing up i was never one that really had power tools and so now i'm starting to get into power tools and stuff like that so my father-in-law is teaching me and i'm learning slowly and i guess my motivating factor is that my wife says well we can't totally rely on my father so why don't you go learn and i'm like well i don't have that bone in my body that has that skill set but yeah i will go out and learn it just for the fact of knowing it knowing it yeah yeah a lot of a lot of what i do is uh, a lot of what i learn is based on the utility of something yeah like like i don't like fish I don't like to eat fish, but I know how to fish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you and I must be cut from the same same uh, loins because I I can't stand fish, but if I had the opportunity to go out and fish, I would. Yeah, and I uh, I have this I have this need to be useful, right? Like I I know how to I've I've framed and drywalled and done the electrical and the plumbing in my basement like a fully rented it. I'm almost done. Um I know the basics of mechanics. I know the you know I can hunt and I can fish and I can do all these other things. But the whole reason that I started learning them was because I figured who else might like why would why would I rely on somebody else to do it? Right, yeah. Like if shit goes south, right it goes really bad. Why I can't just call somebody up and be like, "Hey, man, can you teach me how to fish again?" <laughs> like, that'd be really great. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think my the the motivating factor for me there was the utility of it, right? And I, uh, I always, I've always been one of those jack of all trades, right? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I'll learn something really quickly and then be like, okay, got the concept, move on. Never really been really good at anything except for demolitions. Demolitions were like anything explosives; those are my forte, man. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> yeah. I will blow shit up left, right, and center any day of the week. But the, um, I think the key thing for me was early on, I had a really hard time with that. Right. Because I got bored and I, I did not have that motivation to, uh, to, to continue the learning fact, factor of it. Right. Like I would just get, uh, you know, I, we'd be in math. They'd be like, hey, here's the concept. And I'd be like, good, let's move on. I got it. And they would, you know, spend the next two days going over it and fucking over it and over it. Yeah. And just like it would drive. So I, early on in school, I did not do what I do now. Whereas I just sit down, I get the work done and I move on. Right. I would just get bored and I'd say, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not doing this anymore. And it took me a while to realize that, especially when I got in the army, because the army is basically a manipulation. They, they motivate you through yelling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and your, you know, and your desire to be there in general, and they use um, uh, quite a lot that most people don't think is a great motivation, like shame. Yes, and you know things like that where you're you're really you're putting people down throughout, right? Tear, tear you down, to make tear you down, build you up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, until I recognized that, especially when I became an instructor and I uh, was actually teaching recruits and going through it, I realized that that manipulation that we do within the military, we weren't really motivating people to be good soldiers when they got out. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So we would, we would smash them down and tell them they're pieces of shit and uh, that they couldn't, you know, if I can't trust you to clean your room, I can't trust you with a rifle. <laughs> yeah. Now there's, there's truth to that. Right. But it's not accurate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, there, there's a larger concept and, I used to, 
I used to call them aha moments, and I just I love seeing it in troops when they they actually grasp a concept rather than just what I'm teaching them. Yeah. Right? Like when you teach them machine gun theory, and that you can see it in their head, they're like, "That's why it's that way." <laughs> like, but what do you think about? Let me just uh, I'm gonna ask a question after all this rambling. What do you think about motivation, motivating people versus manipulating them? Right, because you can get somebody to do something that you want them to do by either direction. So what do you think is the, where do you think the line is? Let's put it that way. I think motivation is coming alongside someone and investing in them and helping them along and showing them the truth of the journey. Whereas manip- manipulation is taking the truth of the journey and ramming it down or twisting it for the benefit of that particular event. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because like, like you said, when we were instructors, we used manipulation to, like you said, if you can't make your bed, how can I expect you to fire a rifle properly? It's just like apples and oranges. Like it's two different topics, even though it's the same thing, it there what one is a soft soft skinned uh, fruit, the other has a hard co- hard outer core. It, it's still it's still fruit and it's still healthy for you, but it's like one's an apple, one's an orange. It it, it there there's really no other than the fact that those two items are fruit there's really no correlation between the two because you you can't get an apple with a hard outer core and an and an orange with a soft outer peel yeah they they're two independent uh uh concepts although there's similarities between the two yeah yeah no you're you're right on that one it's um as much as i i used to jack people up for um this was always my fun one. And whenever I'd come into a room and you know, when they get flustered and they're like, Oh, master sergeant. So and they're like, they don't know who to, what rank to call. <laughs> yeah. And I would, I just light them up for it and be like, you don't know the freaking rank system in the Canadian forces. How could you blah, 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 blah. And I would, I would make them do stuff, um, to really integrate it into their head. And yeah. one of the first things we did was chain pushups. So, you know, first we had everyone got down to the pushup position, or I should say the forward leaning rest position. And uh, they would all wait there, and the first person would do a push up, and he would say private, and the next guy would do a push up, and he would say corporal, and the next guy like, and we'd go yeah. all the way up to general, and then we'd start at the air force or start at the navy, and then we go all the way up to admiral, and then we'd start at the air force, and do it again. Yeah, you know, it was a while before they called me a master sergeant again, and I was like, okay, cool. But the next time they did it, we had to bell out the. Uh, the adjunctions, the, um, you know, PTE, CPL, right. right? So we were spelling them. So first person was going to go P, second person T, third person E, fourth person C, and just like all the way through. And man, they did not, uh, they did not like me after that one. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, after they, you know, again, a little while later, they didn't call me master sergeant for a while. Yeah. Third time they did it, we spelt out the whole world. And trust me, trying to get someone to spell out lieutenant colonel, Oh my gosh! Yes. Wow. Yeah, that one was fun. <laughs> um, that that reminds me of uh, going back to when I uh, first got posted, and uh, it, it I, I got injured on on course. So we we were out in the field. We still had one one night left, plus whatever was left of the following day for training. So mm-hmm. they they tasked me to the kitchen, and uh, I was helping them get uh, silverware ready for the mess dinner. So I was in sitting down polishing uh, forks and knives and whatever else was going on the table, and the the drill instructors they they happened to find one of the the private's rifles and found it out in the snowbank. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So you, you can see where this motivation is going. Yep. And uh they uh 
ended up getting uh, at, at the time uh, there was n minus me there was ninety ninety eight people on parade. So like when I was on course there was ninety nine, and then because I got tasked to uh, the kitchen for the remaining eight hours and whatever was left for the following day, the course dropped to 98. So there was 97 people pumping push-ups while this one dude stood there at attention watching yep. everybody. So yep. the, the motivating factor of that night became a uh, woolen sock with um, – an orange that had been left out Ooh, in the snowbank. Sock party. Sock party. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's and uh, I, 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 I wasn't with the I wasn't with the the crowd anymore because where I was uh officially done. Uh I just had to wait to go back to uh headquarters to sign off on paperwork to put me on to med leave. Right. Yeah. So I ended up packing up my uh, cot and moving it to another room. So I had my own room, but I I was still in earshot of the sock party. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, the... that was the motivating factor there that uh, caused everybody to realize that you keep your rifle as close as you can. And you always know where it's at. Yeah, yeah the, you know, the, the sock party is the old school way of doing things. And I, I, I disagree with it. Uh, I don't think it actually teaches anybody anything. It just makes you afraid to. Exactly, to, yeah. To not do something right. And I think it's more of a manipulation, right? Like that, that yeah. is a, uh, you're, you're hurting someone to get them to do something. Sort of, yeah, I don't, I don't like the, the concept. They, there were discussions of it at times on the courses I've been through. And I was always just like, no, we're not, we're not playing that game. We're just not yeah. get that far. Uh, but I was going to say was I, I would get these guys to do pushups so often that they, they hated me. Well, I can't say they hate, they didn't hate me. They did not like me <laughs> Yeah. as an instructor. But what that, what it was is I was actually manipulating them to, to not screw up in front of me. Right. Yeah. Right, because they don't like they know that whatever it is that they do in front of me, if they do it again, it's going to get worse. If they do it again, it's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so I mean, yeah, you could say it was motivation. You could say it was manipulation. Probably both. But at the same time, there were times where we would we would jack people up left, right, and center, and they would just not quit. Like they had an inner motivation that would just not let them. We had a, a young recruit who. Uh, you know, through no fault of his own, he wasn't the smartest guy. Like, well, I can't even say he wasn't that smart. He just, he had trouble remembering the material. Right. Right. So he would get jacked up regularly because he wouldn't remember something or um, uh, people would come out and on formation and he wouldn't have, he would have forgotten his gloves or something. Like it was just, it was just always him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we, you know, everyone takes a light. If you stand out, you know, you're going to, if a nail stands out, it's going to get hammered, right? Exactly, yeah. And uh, so we would we would come at him regularly, and he continued to do things that were just so out, outlandishly wrong in terms of the military aspect. <laughs> and uh, we would continue to try and motivate him to remember these things, but he never stopped. Like he he would just take whatever it is we gave him, and he would just carry on. Yeah, and he never got bitter about it. He never got pissed off. Uh, at one point, this was probably one of my favorite moments of my teaching career. We were in the field, and on the first day, I found somebody's glove, like they had just left left their glove somewhere, it fell it off their kit, and I was just like, "Okay, I'm going to keep this." And then I found a bungee cord. I was like, "Okay, cool, I'll keep this too." And I started finding more and more stuff. Throughout, throughout the uh, couple of weeks we were out there, right? And every so often, somebody would come up and looking for their glove, right? And, hey, Master Corporal, do you happen to have the glove with my name on it? And be like, yes, I do. What are you going to do to get it back? And they would give me push-ups or they would do some right. PT or whatever, right? And they would get it back. And I think by the third day, uh, it had it was snowy and it was that crappy, crusty snow on top with like the deep, soft okay, stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
so we were constantly like, you know, you'd step, crunch through, step, crunch through, and you're just like, it's exhausting uh, to walk up and down the line. So at one point, I actually had a walking stick. I had found this really sweet big stick, and I was using it as a walking stick to get up and down the line. And um, so I was like, oh, I have this bungee cord. I'll just attach this glove to the stick, and then I'll attach this other thing to the stick. And then, like, so I had this friggin' stick. I called it my stick of lost kit plus one because <laughs> I'm a nerd. <laughs> and the um <laughs> and I'd be walking around and people would be laughing about it. Ha 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 Master Corporal, do you find something else to put on your stick today? And I'm like, sure did. I you know, I was finding C9 barrels. Yeah. And uh, you know, just all kinds of stuff. Anyway, at the end of the X, I still have a bunch of stuff on my thing. And the the captain comes out and he's like, Okay, everybody, the declaration for the range will be blah 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 blah. And as he's saying that, I take my stick and I put it right in front of everybody. I'm like, boom. So everybody can see it. And it's got shit all over it. <laughs> nice. And so and I'm I'm just quiet. I let everybody do it. So they start off on their declarations and you know, all the privates and give their declarations to the master corporals and the sergeant. Sergeants all give it to the warrant, warrant turns around, gives it to the captain. Captain's like, okay, everybody on the, and as soon as he was about to say on the truck, I'm like, sir, hold on a second. And he looked at me, he saw my stick and he just put his head down and he walked off. <laughs> yes. And I stood up and I'm like, okay, everybody listen up. You just made as recruits, you just made every single one of your instructors lie to the captain. That is a chargeable offense. Technically speaking, if that captain wanted to charge every single one here, he could. No questions. Yeah. Because they just lied, and they're all like, well, uh, Master Corporal, I don't understand. And I'm like, do you see all this kit here, sitting on this stick? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, did everyone here say that I have all my kit, sir? And they were like, oh, jeez. So, I, we, you know, we cocked him for a little bit, and we gave him some remedial stuff. And I watched this kid who he'd, uh, who had been just getting jacked up, all week he'd been just he was exhausted he had nothing left i'm like okay and one of my favorite things to do is uh weapons appreciation yeah so you, you take the weapon you put it out in front of you you're like aha and just hold it there and i i watched as his shoulder started to give out and i was like okay everybody weapons over your head and i watched as he could not lift the rifle off of his helmet like he was pushing as hard as he could and he couldn't get the rifle off his head and what blew me away was that he kept trying. Yeah. Like he did not stop. And the level of motivation that that kid had to just, even though like his muscles were not, were not agreeing with him, right? He was yelling and screaming at his shoulders, probably just like lift the, lift this thing off my helmet because he had a couple of sergeants right in his face, just yelling at him to get this thing off his helmet and he could not lift it. Yeah. But, but, he kept trying. He never quit. He never, like, you could see that he never let his arms relax. Right, yeah. And, you know, that's what motivation can do for you. I, yeah. I, I love telling that story because it is it's hilarious, first off. But the, the key thing, I think, about motivation is when, as you said earlier, when you find your why, when you find what it is that actually drives you and actually um, you, can, you can draw from at any point in time, when you find that, you are unstoppable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and as instructors, the one thing that we do as far or the, the one key that we, we have in motivating people to do anything is to basically convince themselves, convince the people that we're instructing that it's not a complete waste of time. That there is yeah. there there is a purpose to us doing whether it's manipulation or motivation, there there's a reason and that is not a complete waste of time to be doing the the steps to get to that end goal. Just like I I talked about at the beginning of the podcast tonight when I started talking about breaking things down into squads. Yep. People ask, why are we breaking it down into squads? Well, because you want to be able to perform this task like this without having to use your brain, it becomes automatic. Yep. Drill it in. Yeah. 
the um you know drill the, the reason i said earlier why i love drill was i i know what drill started as like why drill became uh such an effective tool in professional armies as a whole and that was you know it started with the greeks and the phalanx and they would train and 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 train until that phalanx was a friggin rock that was it and the romans really perfected it and they started doing you know actual marching drill in combat formations and they would fight with drill and they would you know their centurion would scream out some order and they would move and they would move before they even realized that they needed to move yeah and so when we started doing drill you know i loved it i i was like all right let's get let's get it on (laughs) yeah uh but at the same time again i had that why right i i enjoyed it because i knew what it was about and why where it came from and there were lots of people that didn't lots of people that uh they looked at drill as stupid. Even now, I like I talk to guys who um, who I've worked with for years, guys who've gone all over the place, and they're like, "Drill is the u- most useless piece of shit." I, you know, <laughs> being out on parade and wa- marching around, what, like, what the what the fuck's the point? And I I always tell them the same thing. I always say, you know what, that is the the starting point for every other drill that we do. Right, even before we get a rifle, we learn drill. Right. Even yeah. before we get, you know, before we. Uh, as we're learning how to polish our boots and as we're learning how to, uh, you know, fold our shirts and iron our stuff and blah, 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 hang our towels over the rack at a certain length and a certain distance from each other and all this stuff. We're learning drill. That's the first thing we learn, right? Yeah. And that, uh, that's the starting point. As you said, th- those squads, how you break something down, it translates into life. If you want something, break it down, right? You, you could say, Oh, I, I want to be, um, I want to be prime minister one day. Okay. That seems like an impossible task, right? Right. Yeah. But, and you can have the motivation all you want. Kids say all the time, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. I want to be blah, blah, blah. Right. Kids say these things all the time. Yeah. And they could have all the motivation in the world, but if they don't break it down, they're not getting anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. The ability to break those things down into little bite sized chunks is definitely a learned skill. That's something that, you know, one of the, one of the things that the military does give us, especially when you, you know, you're given orders. Yeah. And, and you have to break those things down into, you can't just say, okay, we're going to go on a patrol today. We're going to walk to here and then come back. Right. <laughs> like, it doesn't, exactly, yeah. doesn't help anybody. No, you got to be able to break it down and say, okay, we're going to go on patrol. This guy's going to be on point. This guy's going to be the radio man. This guy's going to be a machine gunner. This guy's going to be here. And they got to break it down even further. When we stop, this is where everybody's going to move. Under contact, we're going to go here. If we get hit from the rear, we're going to go here from the side. Blah blah blah. And you do all your all your uh, planning. Oh, exactly. And, and it play, it plays out in my current career. Um, when, when we're doing a task, there there's uh, there's a purpose to the task, but then we have to break it down so it can be safely done. And I remember one of my instructors when I went to college for my health and safety. And the way he broke it down was he's like, you're driving down the road and you get a flat tire. What do you do? Well, number one, you pull over to the side of the road, away, a safe distance away from the traffic. You get out and you go to the trunk of your car or wherever your jack is located. And, and then he said, from there, what's the next step? And, and what's the next step? And what's the next step? And he goes, what's, what's, what's your motivation for doing the things that you're doing? And ultimately, it came down to doing things the safest way possible to get us back on the road. Yeah. And that, that, that's so, – so my military learnings – have now transferred into my civilian role, which are now starting to play out in my family life. Absolutely. It applies to everything, right? It does, yeah. Yeah, and it's one of those um, one of those skill sets, I think, especially when you get 
when you find your motivation, when you find what it is that actually drives you. Yeah. It, uh, one of my, uh, I just finished reading this book a little while ago and it's just fantastic. I, I would say it's probably one of my favorites of all time was, uh, Musashi, the book of five rings. Okay. It is phenomenal. And one of the things he says in it is when you know the way broadly, you see the way in all things. And it is, it's a very poignant lesson in pretty much everything. Because when I got out of the military, I really studied leadership. And I'm a big proponent of Jocko Willink and his uh, his thoughts on leadership, which are really no different than every other uh, you know famous leader in the world that has books. <laughs> if you dive into this topic of leadership, you start to realize that all these, the answers are all the same. And just the way people go about it are slightly right, different. Yeah. And and then you start realizing that, you know, the, the basics of leadership, when you start learning about it, they apply to everything. Yeah. Right? Like, and then you, same thing with motivation, same thing with discipline, same thing with um, really, you know, physical fitness. They, they apply, the lessons apply to everything because you're looking at it broadly. And once you know the way broadly, you, uh, you, you'll, know, you'll see the way in all things, right? Yeah. So if you look at it through that lens you'll be able to see it, how it affects every other thing out there. And, you know, it's a, it's an interesting topic, motivation. It's, it is. Yeah. And, and that's been something that I've been to be transparent. I've, I've been struggling a lot with motivation in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because I'm, I'm, I, I've been going through a bit of a rough patch with work and, uh, been kind of in uh, depression and it it if the, the thing about depression that's another topic for another podcast down the road oh yeah i already got it lined up <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh that can really affect your motivation and uh, i i'm learning daily about motivation and trying to get out of this stupid funk that i've been in for I don't know how long, six months or even a year that I've been in this depression and slowly I'm coming out of it. And the, the one learning that I would have is that the more I can be transparent about how each, each activity that I do impacts my success prospects, then it's going to lead to credibility and give me another reason to uh log on to some learning through experts and uh also sharing my experience so others can uh i i guess learn from my experience well that's the whole point of uh the tools for the toolbox that's really what it is it's why i wanted to start this was that we all have we all go through the same thing right it just we look at it differently uh, you know, for depression, the way I handle depression is not the way other people handle depression. I just spoke to yeah. Burke Campbell in the last episode and, you know, his, what worked for him in terms of depression was medication and it worked for him. It didn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work for me in terms of depression. I need, uh, I need something else. I need to, I need to get to work for me. Like I, I need to actually get shit done. And that's, that helps me get out of the depression and fitness. That's the other one is, you know, working out and making sure that I'm fit and I do jujitsu and I do all these other things. But, uh, what the concept really is, is that we all basically know how to do stuff right at the, at the very, you can look at something and say, okay, well, I'm depressed. Well, being sad sucks. So let's try and not be sad. Right. (laughs) Yeah. But you don't know how to, you, you know, whatever it is you're doing might not be working. Okay. So yeah. where do you find other options? Well, you can go see a therapist, which is always great. And I definitely recommend people seeing therapy. Uh, it helped me immensely. But at the same oh, time, yeah. you know, the, we have tools that are surrounding us that we, nobody ever thinks about, right? Yeah. Talk, you know, talk to your parents. I'm sure they've gone through a depressive episode at some point. You talk to your friends, you talk to your mentors, you talk to your, you know, you don't need to cry at their feet and go, Oh, woe is me. My life is so hard. Please help me. Right. You just say, Hey, yeah. 
you know, I've been in this funk for a week or so. I don't really feel like myself, you know, have you ever been through something like that? And they'd be like, oh yeah, that happened to me fucking whatever, right? A couple weeks ago. Yeah. How did you get out of it? Oh, I went back to the gym and I started lifting weights. And you're like, oh, okay, it gives you something to try, right? If it works, cool. If it doesn't, okay, move on to something else. Yeah. And that, yeah. Like I said earlier, uh, that's why I started this podcast is that I just wanted to offer different ways of doing things because I've, I've said this, I think on pretty much every show I've done so far <laughs> was uh, I was in school and I had missed a few tests and I was um, still in the mentality of the military where I was like, Oh my God, I gotta be top student. Why am I not top? student? Oh my God, I missed some tests. That means I'm going to get zeros. And I was like, I was freaking out and I started falling into oppression and I was just like, this isn't working. And then I started missing classes. And then a buddy of mine who had already been through school, he was like, man, C's get degrees. And it just, yeah, I hadn't even conceptualized that that was okay. Yeah. Right? Like I was just uh, the pinnacle of excellence. I am the Canadian veteran and I should be the best one in the room, blah, blah, blah. I, I want to be the top shot. I want, I, I want to be carried on, on the, the chair. Right? The chair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, Where, where's my chair? Where's yeah, my chair? Where the hell is this thing? Yeah. But I realized <laughs> that it, it really doesn't matter. And there, yeah. there's a joke that's, I don't know, so old, but it's, uh, you know, what do you call someone who finished last in their medical school? Doctor. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, uh, I hope people can get motivation out of this because this is exactly what we need. We need someone, we need people sitting around talking about what it is, where it comes from, how, yeah. it, how it stems yeah. itself, uh, you know, what do you do? How how do you find your own center? How do you find blah, 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 all these other things. So, yeah, oh, uh, exactly. Yeah. We've been rolling for a little bit over an hour now. Um, I think this is great. We've got some really great tools for people to use. And I just want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story and talking to them, talking to me about this. Cause this is all oh, right. On. Great yeah, any, any, um, yeah. Yeah. It's been great. So we're going to wrap it up here. Do you got any final points? Anything you want to pass on to the, the world? No, I'll no, not really. No, uh, thanks for having me on. I, I know we've been trying for at least a couple of weeks, and schedules didn't uh, jive, and then yep, all came together. Well, I appreciate you being on, man. It was a really good conversation. That concludes this episode of the Toolbox. I want to thank you for listening. I hope you were able to use some of the information that was offered. I want to thank all those putting it on the line for us every day: military, veterans, first responders, and public servants. Keep up the good work. I look forward to bringing you more tools for your toolbox. And until next time, stay open, stay humble, and stay focused. Chimo.